Every generation of Pokemon has its absolute winners and its absolute stinkers. I stumbled across this video from Flygon HG, link below, where he was ranking Pokemon and Platinum as encounters for a Nuzlocke. So as somebody who enjoys torturing himself with difficult challenges in video games, of course my first thought was, huh, wonder if I could beat the game with just the worst picks. Then the YouTube algorithm gods blessed me with this video by Pokemon Challenges, link below, where he generally ranked all Pokemon across all games. Taking this as a sign, I knew what had to be done. I decided to combine their two picks for the absolute worst of the worst F tier Pokemon in this game, as the only viable encounters for a Pokemon Platinum Nuzlocke. We choose Pitlip as our starter, not because we can use it, but because it gives us a good HM user later if ever necessary. It also forces our rival to have a Torterra in later fights, a slow Pokemon with a potentially exploitable four times weakness to ice. After beating our rival senseless, skipping some story stuff where Cyrus rants at a lake for a while, and learning how to catch Pokemon, we are able to start our Nuzlocke for real. Deploying every tactic just taught to us, Mozart the Krikata is added to our team. And since our level cap for the first gym is 14, we are able to instantly evolve Mozart into Krikatoon, which is honestly pretty busted for this part of the game. I'm not going to be touching on any of these route trainer fights or even rival battles unless there's anything important going on, so let's just skip right on to what we all are here for. Our next encounter in Orberg Gate gets us Gershwin the Zubat. Golbat is listed as an F tier encounter, accounting for games where Crobat doesn't exist, but for our encounter criteria, it counts and is added to the team. Skipping through Orberg to enter the mine, we encounter Hammerstein the Onyx, which I can only spell with one M due to restrictions, who is viable for the same reasons as Golbat. First gym battle against Rourke is genuinely the easiest fight of my life. Hard into plus six defense, repeatedly rock smash until everything dies. Skip up to Flora Roma Town and unlock berries. After farming for a while, we are loaded on Orin berries and catch our next encounter at Valley Windworks. Tesori the Pachirisu, who is listed as an F-tier encounter despite winning worlds, so I'm going to take advantage of that. Cut to beating up three galactic grunts in a row, we are now able to buy honey. This item is key to a good number of encounters for this challenge, some really important ones too. Our first of which is Antonio the Cherubi. Mars in the Valley Windworks is completely bodied by Hammerstein. I didn't even bother to set a pardon because I wasn't planning to keep him in and was going to swap him if he fell low enough, but that never happened. Our next encounter is on this other honey tree and it's combi, which is unfortunately a viable encounter as it's listed separate from Vesbequin since the male doesn't evolve. We name him Herman and send him to the box, never to be seen again. But thanks to Dupes Claws, we won't have to worry about that happening ever again, so let's move on. Inside Eterna Forest, we basically have two viable encounters in either Dust Tox or Beautyfly, and our first battle does give us Lay the Cascoon. Fast forward one more encounter before the next gym and we find Menken the Apom. Our current level cap gives us Dust Tox and Golbat evolutions, and we jump into the fight against Gardenia right away. Turtwig leads setting up Reflect, but just like Rourke, there's only one strategy necessary here. Mozart spams Fury Cutter. Turns out a 160 base power stab super effective move is pretty damn good. I'm gonna be honest, this challenge is a lot easier than the initial idea led me to believe. Feels like a regular Nuzlocke where my starter just died early, which has definitely happened to me before. Maybe a lot of change though, since Jupiter's Skun Tank is notoriously a pain in my ass. But after a lucky avoided death from Night Slash, which I definitely should have seen coming after Screech, a bit of switching later, Gershwin takes it out with Confuse Ray and Fly. Eternity City is ancient history. Our next encounter is a Platinum exclusive Nose Pass in Mount Coronet. Not a great encounter, but I wanted to keep it an option to replace Hammerstein should the need ever arise. And my surprise when I realized I only had one Pokeball left, but hey, it worked, so moving on. We also get an encounter of sorts from Cynthia, who gives us a Togepi egg. Togetic being a viable encounter is, well, it isn't as crazy in this gen without Eviolite, but it's still pretty dang good. Our next set of encounters come from two honey trees above Orberg, the first one giving a male Burmy, which is the only encounter I don't want in this series, but the second tree pulls through with a female Burmy named Miranda. She will come up later. We also find the secret entrance to Wayward Cave and plow through just to pick up the TM for Earthquake, also important for later, might be related. You can see where this is going. In Heart Home City, we hatch Stravinsky the Togepi, and while I could run in circles until it evolves, I feel confident enough in the current team to take on Fantina. Golbat leads against Duskull and grabs the KO with just two bites. Miss Magus comes out, and I'm expecting Psybeam. Antonio comes out, tanks the hit, and sets up Leech Seed to put this threat on a timer. Orenberry and Leech Seed heal most of the damage taken from Shadow Ball. I do consider switching, but I know I'll take at least one more hit here, possibly two, so we set up a sunny day while Miss Magus hits a Confuse Ray. Expecting to be able to two-hit KO, we lock into Petal Dance, but even with Ray's special defense and Leech Seed healing, repeated Shadow Balls knock Antonio down to literally one HP at one point, I then take the hint and swap into Menken. Unfortunately, Miss Magus was selecting a random move here, but Psybeam doesn't do too much that Leech Seed doesn't heal. All Menken needs to do is not die while Leech Seed finishes the job. He does his absolute damnedest to mess even that up, 
and hits himself in confusion, but fortunately the ghost is finished off. Mencken lives another day. Haunter comes out next, and I fire off Tickle just to lower the overall damage of Shadow Claw here, since it does have a high critical hit ratio, and I want to preserve as much HP as possible for those potential hits. We then swap to Hammerstein before Mencken has a chance to go down. Turns out to be largely unnecessary though, as Rock Tomb takes an easy KO, and the battle is put behind us with no deaths. Two with low HP, but no sacrifices necessary. We pick up a good rod in the next route and make our way to the Solacean Ruins. Solacean? So Solacean? Make our way to Solacean Ruins for our next encounter, which is, yeah, it's unknown. It's not being used. I don't know why I spent the time coming over here. Moving on into Veilstone City, we unlock the department store and game corner. Now, I could spam the repeatable trainers for money to buy whatever I need and waste weeks of my life, or I could sell the infinite rare candies to shortcut my way there. So I did that. We also get an encounter in Veilstone City of a Porygon from this guy in the house. Porygon actually has a crazy special attack stat for this run, and we are definitely going to make use of that. Lo, the Porygon is added to the team. But not to be seen in this fight as of yet, because fast forward to Maylene, I expect this fight to be super easy. I lead Stravinsky to set up screens and swap out to Antonio to set up. Solar Beam replacing Petal Dance lulls me into a false sense that I might sweep, but I forget Lucario resists grass and almost lose Antonio for my arrogance. Look at me, specifically replacing Petal Dance so I could swap and then proceeding not to swap when it would benefit me. Whoop de frickin' do. Lay comes in next and swaps neutral hits, whittling down Lucario. Metal Claw procs Lay's Citrus Berry. Knowing I won't need Lay anywhere else in this fight, I get another hit in to take Lucario down to red and swap after going low to get Gershwin in on what I think is a random move with a chance to be Drain Punch. Either way, Gershwin comes in and Wing Attack takes out Lucario. I swap to Mozart, who I know will take two Rock Tombs after Citrus, taking the chance to put Macho to sleep and whittle him down to half. Then I swap Hammerstein in on a resisted strength, expecting Rock Tomb and really expect Onyx to do more damage here. That damn attack stat. Also, Maylene's Machoke doesn't have Drain Punch for whatever reason, so I wasn't risking him healing. Two Karani Chops later, and knowing a third is coming, Gershwin gets a free switch and is able to KO Machoke at this range. The strategy of spreading damage around the team is a big thing in Nuzlocke's, but I found it super apparent in this run just due to the lower overall power of the team. Not only do they have to share the damage taken, but they also have to share the damage dealt. This doesn't sit super well with me, knowing that by the time we reach the E4, there's going to be a lot more opportunity for one-shots, but I guess we'll deal with that when we get there. Putting those scary thoughts behind us for now, we get some berry farming in now that we have citrus berries, and make a quick trip to the underground to get light clay for Stravinsky. Honestly, this is the only item other than berries that I use on this entire run. Then we can get our Pastoria Great Marsh encounter of Struss the Yanma, boxed and never seen again because unfortunately we aren't allowed to evolve it. Our other possible encounters here were Tropius and Carnivine, which also weren't great, but I never had the opportunity to use Atropius in a Nuzlocke before, so I thought I'd at least try. There's a rival fight here that, fun fact, I actually cut out in the first draft of this on complete accident, and only went back to find it because I was looking at the rival page on Bulbapedia and realized I was missing one in the script. Whoops. But it was forgotten for a reason because Lo just up and sweeps the whole team after Stravinsky sets up screen, so moving on. Next gym fight in Crasher Wake, I don't expect this fight to take any more effort than that forgotten rival fight, leads Stravinsky to set up screens on Gyarados, who we also put to sleep. After a quick heal with Wish, just in case I need him later, we swap to Antonio and set up Sun. Growths turn him into a monster who one-shots Wake's entire team with Solar Beam, just taking one quick break to set up Sun for a second time. Some story stuff with Team Galactic happens, then Cynthia shows up and gives us a bag of duck drugs who we proceed to give to ducks. In Celestic Town, another galactic grunt awaits us, but he doesn't give us any issues. Inside the cave, I could have sworn there was a Cyrus fight and, oh, yep, here it is. Okay, here we go. Mozart leads and tanks a critical hit ice punch right off the bat, but returns with a super effective rock smash. Knowing we can't take a second hit after that lucky roll, we swap to low and KO with signal beam. Golbat comes out next, but it doesn't take a thunderbolt. Murkrow, Murkrow also doesn't take a thunderbolt. You can see why low is good. Then with Surf in hand, it's time to get to the next gym. We get our encounter here first though with the good rod. Talus the Finian joins the team and we evolve her into a Luminion right away. She surfs us over to Canalave City. There's a rival fight here over the bridge that can be kind of scary, so we prepare for that by pushing buttons on our Poketech accidentally. Then healing, leveling up, learning some new moves, and rival fight go. Staraptor is actually a pretty scary lead, but being able to set up Reflect and put it sleep while it goes for a double team makes it easy. AI likes to prioritize status moves, so we're pretty in the clear to do this. Then we swap to Lo, who's able to get a plus one special attack off of download, and KO Staraptor immediately with Thunderbolt. Heracross comes out, and I know it'll go for a brick break and destroy screens, so I make a quick switch out to Gershwin to tank the hit and KO with Fly. 
Rapidash comes out next, but it has nothing to threaten Gershwin, so we spam Poison Fang and Bite until it goes down. Torterra comes out next, but again, this has nothing for Gershwin, who is able to take it out with Fly and Poison Fang. Floatzel comes in and we swap to Talus, who gets off an attract and resists all his water moves, while firing off more powerful surfs of her own. Poor Roy can't put up a fight even against this F-tier team. Before the gym, there's a little bit of prep to be done. We fly back to Orberg Gate and pick up the TM for Brick Break. Back in Canalave, we are able to delete Rock Smash off Mozart and replace it with our new TM. Then we make our way to Iron Island, pick up strength from the kind stranger outside, and utilize the cave to change Miranda's cloak and evolve her into Wormadam who we can also give our beloved Earthquake TM to. Now, we're ready for the gym. Byron leads Magneton and we lead Miranda, selected for this situation exactly. Earthquake picks up the quick KO and we're off and running. Steelix comes out next, probably could have stayed in, but we swapped to Talus with the idea to hit on Steelix's weaker special defense. Steelix goes for Sandstorm on the switch though, so Talus takes the turn to set up Rain. However, Steelix hits a little too hard for my liking with Earthquake, so we strop out Stravinsky while Steelix sets up Sandstorm again. Reflect goes up and Steelix hits a fairly weak Ice Fang, but it does end up freezing Stravinsky. I try to stay in and thaw, but not wanting to waste Reflect turns, we swap out to Antonio and set up Sun, which is immediately countered with another Sandstorm. The Weather War goes on for a while, but we are able to set up a Leech Seed in between, and then are able to get Sun up and fire off two Solar Beams to take out Steelix. Watching this back, I'm thinking I did make it too hard on myself. I guess it was safer to make the switches and spare the chance of Miranda taking too much damage from Ice Fang, but I digress. With that in mind, Bastion comes out, Miranda comes out, Earthquake kills Mastodon, match over. Some story stuff happens where we meet the professor and he talks about something to do with the lakes. I'll be honest, I don't think I've ever really paid attention here. But a lot of explosion leads me to Lake Valor where Team Galactic is just kind of hanging out, making sushi, I guess. But the grunts do nothing to stop me, so on to my favorite Galactic boss, Saturn. He leads Golbat while we lead with Miranda who only gets off one rock blast before hitting herself in confusion. Not risking Miranda at half HP, Stravinsky swaps in, takes Toxic. Reflect gets set up, Golbat gets put to sleep between wishes to stay alive, and when the poison damage gets too high, we swap back to Miranda, who fully heals off of one last wish and takes out the Golbat. Unfortunately, the incoming Bronzor has Levitate, not Heatproof, so Earthquake isn't an option, but I'm pretty sure we won't take much from its attacks anyway, so we power through with a couple of neutral bug bites to take the KO. Toxic Crook comes in next, and since Faint only does about 20 damage, Earthquake takes a clean one-hit KO. Sandy Cloak Wormadam was actually my secret weapon for the later half of the game, if that wasn't obvious. Don't sleep on these bugs, man. Cricketoon will sweep the first half and Wormadam the second. It's insane. Are we sure these are F-tier? Dawn of the Professor needs saving at like Verity, where we find Mars for a second fight because she just doesn't get tired of losing, I guess. I forgot to heal before this fight, I'll be honest, but I don't think that'll change much, except that Golbat goes for Confuse Ray turn one and Low hits himself in confusion right off the bat. <laughs> that. Anyway, we snap out next turn to hit Thunderbolt, but Air Cutter does scary damage. Pretty sure that move has a high critical hit ratio, and we won't survive one of those. But not really having anyone in the back that I feel like will take it well, since I didn't bring Hammerstein for some reason. We stay in, our Citrus Berry activates, we pick up the KO. I knew I'd survive one normal hit in Confusion, or potentially one critical hit without Confusion, so the odds were at least decent that turn to survive. Bronzor comes out and confuses Low again, so we swap to Mozart. Also not healed, but he eats two extra sensories easy, and picks up the kill after 2x scissors. Brugly is up next and is what I've been trying to preserve HP in the back for. I'll be honest, I'm still a little scared of this thing. Miranda has the highest defense on the team, so we swap in to take the obvious fake out. Slash knocks our health low with a critical hit, but our Citrus Berry takes the edge off, and the Bug Bite eats Brugly's held Citrus as well, getting us back to full and flipping the tables on the fight. We know Slash Crit won't KO, so despite being slower, we're free to stay in, take the Brugly out with Earthquake. Professor blathers something about rival up north, and I guess since we just so happen to be going that way for the gym, we may as well stop and check up on him. Through the mountains and into the snow, we find the HM for Rock Climb, which seems super useful. We get two encounters up here, the first of which is Mowler the Swine Up. We see our rival up a cliff yelling something about smell you later and promptly ignore him as we heal in Snowpoint City. Then we run back in the middle of the night into a deadly blizzard and find Arends the Snow Runt at the lakefront, who we are only allowed to evolve into Glalie, but I'll take that. One annoying sliding puzzle later and we fight Candace, the ice gym leader with a funny name. Her lead of Sneasel feels incredibly overused at this point, and since Aerial Ace only does about half to Mozart, we are able to retaliate with a four time super effective brick break and call it a day. Mozart did his job, so when Pile of Swine comes out, we switch for Talus. Stone Edge misses on the switch, so hey, that's cool. Talus tries to set up Rain, but Pile of Swine sets up Hail after, which I guess is kind of like Rain. Also, I'm getting terrible deja vu to the last gym fight. Pilot Swine really doesn't have anything to hit Talos with, so we safely set up Rain successfully this time while Pilot Swine goes for a weak avalanche. Thanks to Rain boosted super effective stab, we are able to one-shot the following turn. In my mind, the problems with Hail are over, 
but alas, I somehow forgot that Abomaso has snow warning, and the problems only continue to pile up. This thing is absolutely going to Woodhammer, so we swap into Lay and eat it with four times resist. Lay does not win a 1v1 against this monster, unfortunately, but all I'm trying to accomplish is putting on a timer with Toxic. Unfortunately, Lay does her best to mess that up by missing the first one. Okay, not a problem. Take your time, I guess. The second Toxic does hit, and none too soon as Avalanche knocks Lay to yellow and procs her Citrus Berry. But with a Bomb of Snow poisoned, I know we have a good shot here. We swap to a Renz, who easily tanks Avalanche, and start spamming Ice Fang. I am fully prepared to sacrifice either a Renz or Lay or both to this fight, whatever buys enough turns for Toxic to do its thing. But that never becomes necessary as a Bomb of Snow can't take the pressure and falls to poison with a run still above half HP. With Frostlass coming out next, my mindset continues, and knowing this thing is just going to try and cheese us out with evasion boosts, we stay in just trying to land a few super effective crunches to start whittling it down. But Arends more than pulls his weight, doesn't miss a single crunch, powers right through Frostlass's Citrus Berry, full restore, and survives a critical hit Shadow Ball to win the day with only 20 HP remaining, surviving on a thread thanks to his own Citrus Berry and Ice Body. Well, Done, Arends. You had one job, and my boy, you did it stupendously and more. Now with the badge in hand, we can teach Hammerstein Rock Climb and meet with our rival at the lake. But it turns out there isn't much to do there as Roy mopes around a bit, Jupiter just walks off and tells us where to go next for more story. I head there straight away without getting lost or forgetting where the story picks up next. Yes, sir, that's exactly what happened. Back in Veilstone, at their clearly evil headquarters that everyone seems far too okay with, Cyrus tells his minions that he's going to destroy the world, and they're all very cool with that for some reason. After learning that Cyrus is only two years older than I am in real life and giving me a brief existential crisis, we sleep in one of his napping beds and and meet him upstairs for a round of fisticuffs. What am I saying? In this game, there are two kinds of fights. Those that lead with a rat, and those that lead with a bat. So basically, classic Gen 1 Team Rocket. Oh, also, Sneasel dies to Mozart in one hit. Are you tired of hearing that yet? But like any good boss, he also has a bat. So we swap to low, but unfortunately do miss the special attack boost. That's fine though, as Eric Hutter Poison Fang doesn't kill, while Thunderbolt definitely does. Low did need to use his Citrus Berry to get through that though. Fights are starting to get scary, and we're losing the ability to one-shot most things in the game. Besides Sneasel, of course. Honchkrow comes out, and I'm pretty sure we take one hit here, so I decide to get damage where we can. Thunderbolt drops him low enough to still leave him at half after eating a citrus, so that was a good call. Hunt Crow is using a random move next, but I swapped to Tesori on the chance of Drill Peck. Unfortunately, Fain Attack deals half damage. I know Tesori will outspeed, but I'm not sure she gets the KO here. I decide to go for Spark anyway, knowing that at the very least I can get him to use up his potion the next turn and start eating into that health as well. Which is exactly what happens. In my mind, I'm thinking I should sacrifice Tesori here for a clean switch into Wormadam, but I've come this far deathless, so I decide in a moment of brilliance to swap in Murdadam to eat the faint attack, and then take a Drill Peck to survive on 2 HP before KOing with Rock Blast. You know, entirely calculated. I knew that would happen. Yep. Like I said, in retrospect, I should have just used Spark, sacrificed Tesori, and swapped into a Renz to use Ice Shard for the KO, but you know. Whatever. Things happen. Maybe I just want an excuse to use Pylos Wine instead of Wormadam. Or maybe I just wanted to FURTHER PROVE THE RADIANCE OF BUG POKEMON! <clears throat> uh, one of those. Still one fight remaining though, and after one more quick power nap, we take on Saturn for the second time. This time we have a lead against Bats, who I don't know why I didn't utilize in the last fight better. Let's just pretend I was saving him for this one, okay? Ice Fang two shots Golbat, three crunches, and an Ice Shard KO Bronzor, and we swap to Miranda to take out Toxicroak. Well, actually, I swapped to Mozart first to take the expected Brick Break, then into Miranda, who I didn't realize would also have resisted the fighting move, but, like... Alright, guys, I, I beat this run in literally a day, so this was coming up to, like, hour six or something. Cut me some slack. I was tired. Also want to point out that I did not have a plan B for this Toxicroak if Miranda had died in the last fight. Maybe, like, Psybeam Porygon or something? Anyway, fast forward to Sky Pillar, where we get to fight both Mars and Jupiter. Again! both of whom still refuse to evolve their Bronzor. We're paired with our rival, who for this fight decides to lead with Munchlax. But for our fights, lead Staraptor? Okay, buddy, fate of the world on the line, and you wanna fight with Munchlax. Got it. I do my absolute damnedest to kill all three annoyances on the field with Talus Surf, and it works. Staraptor comes out after Perugly, dropping her attack, and it's smooth sailing from there. Perugly falls to Staraptor, who also promptly dies, Talus sets up Rain through Confusion and then fires off Surf, KOing both Golbat and Rapidash. Sorry, Rapidash. But Floatzel comes in next, so the Rain is good. I swap in Hammerstein, who gets poisoned, and then Gershwin, planning to just fly until Roy takes out the last Pokemon's gun tank. 
but our fly actually lands after close combat knocks it to red and we get an easy sweep. Listen, a lot happens in double battles very quickly, but you get the gist of it. Also want to point out that my team for Sky Pillar is not great for two reasons. One, I know I'm going to need fodder for the fight ahead. Two, I needed HM users. They just ended up being the same Pokemon. But that does mean I'm putting a lot of reliance on Low, Talus, and Miranda to carry us to victory. I'm not extremely confident in that, but it is the best shot that I have got. Story stuff happens and Cyrus summons God 1 and God 2, so that's cool. Why isn't anyone stopping him? Oh. Well, now that Cyrus is dead, I guess that means we can, uh, follow him into hell? Thanks, Cynthia, what a suggestion. I'll admit, I thought the Distortion Realm was the absolute coolest thing ever when I was younger, playing this for the first time. Revisiting it now is absolutely painful and such a slog. So let's skip to the fun part, shall we? Cyrus is waiting for us at the end, and it's battle time, baby. He leads Houndoom, and we lead Talus. Luminion actually has pretty good natural speed, and being five levels higher, I do expect to outspeed this Hellhound, which we do. And thanks to Houndoom being an even worse Pokemon than Luminion, we get a one-hit KO and move on. And rolling! Gyarados comes in next, we outspeed and U-turn into low, again missing the special attack boost. Either way, he eats an Earthquake and a Waterfall easy, and one shots with Thunderbolt. Two down, but now we're eating into our health resource, so things aren't looking too pretty. Onchkrow comes out next, and I decide that we take one hit, so I attempt to go to Recover just to scout that out. In fact, we actually outheal his damage, if only just, so we play that song and dance for a little bit until Low is able to safely fire off a Thunderbolt, knocking Honchkrow to yellow. Then Hammerstein is able to swap in and get the easy KO with Rock Tomb. Weavile comes in next, and wouldn't you know it, I actually don't have Mozart's Brick Break for this. No matter, we swap into Talos expecting Fake Out, and then take a Night Slash before Citrus Prox, and we U-turn into Gershwin. I don't really expect that we outspeed here, but I do think we take one hit and KO and return to Fly, so that's exactly what happens. Cyrus's last Pokemon is Crobat. It's at this moment I realize I should have brought a Renz instead of Miranda. But we swap into Hammerstein, tank an Air Slash, and attempt to paralyze with Dragon Breath. Not before getting confused by Confuse Ray, because bats only do one damn thing! Unfortunately, even though both Dragon Breaths hit, we don't get the paralyze. And the third turn, we actually flinch. So, now for a decision to be made. Do I let Hammerstein go down already? Or is it smarter to preserve his bulk? We swap in Menken, who actually takes the Air Slash pretty well. Unfortunately, the same could not be said for Cross Poison, and Menken goes down, giving a free switch into Miranda, who promptly fumbles the bag entirely and misses the Rock Blast on what was essentially a free turn. Menken gave his life just for you to throw our only chance away. But actually, I start to wonder if Crobat is out of Air Slashes or just Brain Cells, as Toxic and Confuse Ray, no, no, never mind. They definitely do damage. And there's the Air Slash. Oh boy. Well, we do get one Rock Blast off knocking Crobat to half. Talus then comes in. I've got one play left in the bag. After being knocked to red from Air Slash and Cross Poison, I'm not sure if Surf kills at this range, so Talus lands in a tract. Crobat, then immobilized by the power of love, is KO'd by Surf. Even if the attract wasn't necessary, man, did it make for good television. Anyway, Cyrus then tells me I can't catch Giratina, so I catch Giratina. Can't use it, but that's okay, I just like proving people wrong. Then Cynthia and I jump blindly into another hole and we're done. I have to go meet the professor at his lab to let him know I'm alive. Then we're off to Sunny Shore. Technically on this route, we do have one more encounter in Chatot, but I don't think he's a night encounter and I couldn't be bothered putting in the effort for a Chatot after more than a bit of running around, so we move on. If I really feel like I need to replace Gershwin, then I'll be back. A scary clown stops us as we enter Sunny Shore and tells us to challenge the gym. Feeling vaguely threatened, we move quickly to do exactly that. First evolving Maller into Paloswine, then fishing the gym leader out of the lighthouse, then solving his stupid gear puzzle, and finally, we are allowed to challenge him for a battle. Writing my previous wrongs, we lead with Arends against Volkner's Jolteon. He goes for Thunder Wave, while Arends does what he does best and just starts ramming away with biting moves. Jolteon misses an Iron Tail, and Volkner uses a Hyper Potion. Hilariously, he misses another one while Arends is fully paralyzed. Two Ice Fangs and Iron Tails later, neither of us missing twice in a row, I'm faced with a choice to either risk not being fully paralyzed and go for the Ice Shard or switch out. But knowing Arends is an absolute monster, I feel like I have nothing to worry about. And true to that intuition, Arends picks up the first kill. Expecting a Focus Blast, we swap into Miranda, who this time I remember does in fact resist fighting. Earthquake picks up the KO after Raichu's Signal Beam, and Electivire is out next. This thing does have Fire Punch, but I expect to survive at least one hit from it, which we do, and get the KO in retaliation. Luxray has good coverage and that makes it scary, but we swap to Hammerstein, who unfortunately gets burned for his transgressions on the switch. We attempt to paralyze because I'm pretty sure this gen still lets you do that, but it doesn't happen anyway, and even Hammerstein's defense can't take another good hit like that Ice Fang. So we swap into Pilot Swine, who at least isn't weak to Ice Fang, and I'm fairly certain his bulk is enough to take a non-stab Fire Fang, so we stay in and pick up the KO with Earthquake. I think we are mostly lucky to avoid the second burn there, but a win is a win. Last gym down and upwards we go towards the Pokemon League. Our rival stops 
stops us blabbering about something and a girl gives us the HM for waterfall, probably purely because she feels bad about me having to listen to his ranting. And then we enter Victory Road. I'll be honest, I got a little lost, but the trainers in here really weren't too bad. And I definitely cheesed it a little bit when I pulled up directions and was able to fully heal between fights. But I hate Victory Road in every game, in every generation. I hate Victory Road. I hate it. I hate Victory Road. Then we climb the waterfall into the Pokemon League. The last six fights of the run are ahead. That is right, I said six because our rival decides to take one last shot at us right before we are able to enter the league. What a bitch. He leads to Raptor and hits hard with close combat. It actually lands a critical hit, but we're able to get the yawn off and swapped into Miranda. See guys, I am learning. While he falls asleep, Rock Blast only needs a hit twice for an easy KO. Not keeping Miranda in against Floatzel, we swap to low, get a special attack boost, and are promptly frozen by Ice Fang. So that's super cool. <laughs> Cool. Staying in one turn to try to salvage this with a quick thaw but failing, we switch to Talus. But realizing I need to preserve HP on Talus, we U-turn to Mozart and knock Floatzel the one with X Scissor. But Roy grows a third brain cell during this fight and swaps into Rapidash. Unfortunately for him, I took a page out of the AI booklet and went for my own random move, hitting for half with Brick Break on the switch. Being 10 levels higher helps the outspeed and gets the KO. Heracross comes in next, and because Mozart is again one of God's chosen few, he survives Rock Slide on just three HP and completely misses the sink. Well, I guess you can't win it all. We switch in Gershwin, since I know he'll be able to take one Rock Slide and outspeed, which is exactly what happens, and he gets the knockout with Fly. Floatzel comes back out, much to my confusion, and yeah, we just outspeed and KO with Bite. Snorlax comes in next, and there's really no plan here other than to out brute force it. So Miranda does that with Bug Bite, because I guess I assumed he'd be holding a Berry and Earthquake. I'm hoping Torterra's at random move here. My only play is to sacrifice something to get a clean switch into Talus, or alternatively, sacrifice Talus to get a clean switch into Gershwin. Of course, I consider that Gershwin does resist Leaf Storm, and Talus has decent bulk, so there's obviously a chance either one could make it here. But I decide Gershwin has a better shot in the E4 than Talus, so I make the call to risk Talus here. But high risk, high reward, I suppose, as Talus switches in, survives on just 6 HP, and then the Chosen One is able to outspeed with an Ice Beam and clear the Torterra. Is what I would say, but I forgot to give Talus Ice Beam. The reason we gave our rival this starter, the risk we took to get into this position, and I couldn't even be bothered to check that we had the move in the first place. It's fine. I'm okay. It's good. It's, it's what I wanted. Retreating back into my mind palace, I guess we're just taking both options here. I decide to swap into Gershwin without worry now that Torterra's special attack has dropped, so maybe it was worth something after all. But that doesn't even matter as Torterra goes for an Earthquake for a clean switch in entirely, then we miss the first fly. That's okay. Gershwin survives two crunches between two more flies for the knockout. What a wild ride that was. Should've just swapped Gershwin in the first place. I'll be the first to say it, this run does not deserve the few casualties it has. I would not be able to replicate this. In fact, I'm almost not happy with this run because of how few deaths it has. Is the game easy? Well, yeah, Pokemon is designed for children and Gen 4 isn't necessarily regarded as one of the harder generations, but I expected these limited Pokemon to provide more challenge to the run. I may try this run again with more restrictions in the future, but I guess leave a comment down below letting me know if you'd like to see that or maybe what restrictions you'd like to see added on. But I also don't expect to not have another casualty before the end of the run. There's only one way out of this now. Time for the Elite Four. Aaron is up first and he leads the Omega. Again, AI loves to prioritize status moves, so he just begins to set up double team while we promptly put him to sleep after a quick light screen just to make make sure we tank his powerful bug buzz. We then also get a reflect up for good measure. Miranda is able to come in easily, getting a two hit rock blast, which doesn't KO, but does force Aaron to use a full restore, while a three hit rock blast then gets the one hit KO in the next turn. Drapion comes in, and short of a crit or freeze, there isn't much this can do to me, so of course it gets a crit and a flinch after the first Ice Fang. Oh well, I decide the odds are in my favor enough for that to not happen twice, so we hit an earthquake, and no, wait, actually we do flinch again. Okay, now we hit an earthquake, and it doesn't even kill. Whatever, it's fine. Talus can come in, take a resisted Ice Fang, and pick up the KO. Heracross is still easy, swap in Gershwin, take the resisted close combat, KO with Fly. Next, Vizbequint comes in and proves to be an issue with heal and defend order, but I don't even get a chance to consider other options before Fly gets a critical hit KO. Guess what goes around comes around. Caesar comes in next and my glaring lack of fire types is biting me hard now, but we're able to get Confuse Ray off just as a contingency and swap back into Stravinsky. Taking an Iron Head on the switch and thinking my stars that fairy type isn't a thing in this game, Reflect comes up, then we're able to swap into Mozart, who promptly takes a critical hit and falls to eight HP. I have a funny feeling these fights 
might be a little difficult. I switch into low with the hope to recover stall out and chip away until I get a status off of try attack, which doesn't take long when we get a freeze on Caesar. Then we risk the thaw, but I figure it never worked for me, so the universe owes me, swap to Miranda and KO with Earthquake. One narrow fight down, Four more to go. Bertha leads Wishcash, who gets the same treatment as the Omega did before, getting put to sleep while screens go up. Low comes out, but can never get a special attack boost to save his life, and trades blows with Wishcash until it goes down. Lyscore comes out and takes another Ice Beam. Well, takes is generous. Hippodon comes in, and I swap Mozart to take a resisted Earthquake, and though he survives one Stone Edge, we miss the Sing and are forced to switch. I decide to go for the same strategy the last time we fought a fat boy, and just brute force through it with Miranda. Golem has Fire Punch, so we swap to Talus, who takes one Earthquake, sets up Rain, and gets back-to-back -back knockouts on Golem and Rhyperior with Surf. Definitely the E4 member I was least worried about, but even that had a few tense moments. Next is Flint, which, okay, I lied. This is the L8-4 member I was least worried about. We know what Stravinsky wants to do, and he does it, then we swap to Talus, who is unexpectedly becoming quite the MVP in this Elite Four run. I am really regretting saying that Gershwin probably had a better chance here than Talus, and risking Talus during the rival fight. But hey, go off, Queen! Prove me wrong! Rain Dance. Surf, 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 waterfall. GG. Also, I just want to say one quick thing, where my level cap for this Elite Four was to match Lucian's ace at 59, and then level them up as we go to meet Cynthia. Honestly, when I do this next again, I'll probably just level to meet each member as we go. But anyway, last Elite Four next. Lucian leads with Mr. Mime for his own screen, so we change it up and lead with Mozart this time. x gets him low, but I decide to pivot to Brick Break just to get rid of his screens, but I'm confident we can take a hit and retaliate, especially since Lucian takes a turn to try to heal. Gallade comes in next, and we are deathly afraid of this thing. We swap to Miranda and dodge a Stone Edge. She takes a hefty hit from Psycho Cut, but fortunately, Gallade is holding a berry, so we can use Miranda to take that for ourselves with Bug Bite and heal that damage back up. Leaf Blade does just a smidgen more, but Earthquake definitely kills at this range, and with our own berry still intact, Lucian's ace is down with no casualties. Now we just need to get through the rest of his team. Ispian comes out and hits a powerful Psychic, and Earthquake only gets him to about the same range. Guess that means it's time for screens, because wow, that hurts. Stravinsky comes out, takes two hits, gets put to red, but does manage to get light screen up. Then we swap to Low, who, with his newly acquired Shadow Ball, picks up the KO. Alexam comes out next, and it has Focus Blast. I definitely don't have a clean switch here. While other members of my team might take Focus Blast, they definitely don't outspeed an Alakazam or take two more hits after that. He has Psychic for Gershwin and Energy Ball for Talus. In that same vein, Low can take one Focus Blast behind the screen, but not two. My best bet is to hope for a miss. A move notorious for missing just has to miss once. How hard can that be? Focus Blast hits, Shadow Ball gets half, Low goes down, a second death. Clearing the Elite Four suddenly seems so much less likely. Talus comes in, takes an Energy Ball, and U turns out, getting the KO in the process. With absolutely no plan for Bronzong, we get Mozart in and put it to sleep. Two X Scissors take it out, so I won't think too hard about what could have happened there. The Elite Four is done, over, finished. The real challenge remains. Five Pokemon left to my name and the most powerful champion of all time in front of me. Sorry, Steven. We lead Mozart against Spiritomb, put it to sleep, and spam X Scissor until it dies. Lucky sleep turns, but Spiritomb was definitely not the Pokemon we were worried about here. Togekiss comes out next, so we swap into his tiny counterpart in Stravinsky. Despite having Shockwave, Wish out heals, and with our new Protect in tow, we're able to stall it out and safely put it to sleep. We opted for Protect over Reflect here, since most of Cynthia's team is special, and I wanted a guaranteed sleep with Yawn should it ever come up. Light screen goes up, Talus comes out, Togekiss annoyingly heals after being put low with Ice Beam, and we swap back to Stravinsky to rinse and repeat, keeping our health up with Wish. Rosaried comes out next, and is 90% of the reason why Gershwin is on this team at all. He comes in and one hits with Fly. No deaths yet! Milotic has Ice Beam, so we bring in Talus, and all I'm trying to do is get chip damage in here. Once we take too much, we swap to Stravinsky and bring back the cheese. Milotic must not see a KO with Ice Beam, since it goes for Mirror Coat, making putting it to sleep a breeze. Then we wish, put Light Scream back up, and wish back to heal Talus too. Even foot once again. Trying not to waste all of Stravinsky's PP, we swap into Mozart for some more chip damage. Milotic wakes up and knocks God's Chosen One to red with Surf, before Mozart turns around to land a Sing and put it right back to sleep. Stravinsky comes out after screens go down, sets them back up, uses his last wish to heal up and assure a safe switch, then Gershwin comes in and all we can hope for is more cheese. Confuse Ray, fly to dodge attacks, and tanking ice beams thanks to light screen. Eventually, it works, and Milotic gets down to red. Then Milotic is fully healed with full restore, and my stomach plummets. Time to just put the pedal to the metal. Gershwin had one job, to take out the Roserade, and he did it. Time to get the mileage out of him. Confuse Ray, hitting Confusion, fly, knock to yellow, ice beam, Gershwin lives on two, fly, knock to red, 
Ice Beam kills Gershwin is down. Gone, but not forgotten. Talus is clear to come in, outspeed, and KO with Waterfall. Garchomp in next. Okay, we have a clear win condition against this. Talus should definitely take a hit here. We have Ice Beam. We're good, right? Four times effective, one hit KO. Earthquake does insane damage, activating Citrus Berry. And Ice Beam does only just over half activating his Citrus Berry in return. One of us definitely has the advantage here. The only win condition here now is Talus's Ice Beam, and there's only one way to do it. Stravinsky comes in, Earthquake doesn't affect, and we pull the Yawn Protect combo to put him to sleep, avoiding a Dragon Rush in the process. Risking a wake up, but with no other real options, Talus comes in on the Sleeping Dragon and hits the Ice Beam before he has a chance to wake up. Garchomp is down. Lucario is Cynthia's last Pokemon, this run is almost at an end. Nuzlocke or no, this team of F-tier Pokemon is about to take out the Sinnoh Elite Four and Cynthia. Unfortunately, much like our path to clearing Garchomp, the only good way to take out Lucario is with Miranda, who needs a clean switch. And despite the hard work she put in, we're forced to make a sacrifice, and Talus falls to extreme speed. Just to be extra safe, we bring in Stravinsky to put Lucario to sleep, screens go up, and then Miranda is free to come in and wreak havoc, which turned out to not even be necessary as Earthquake takes the one hit KO against Lucario and he falls. Cynthia falls. We win. So I guess kids, let this be a lesson to you. Vanilla Pokemon games are easy. Easy enough that the absolute worst of the worst can clear one with minimum casualties. But that's okay, that's fun. I actually really enjoy these semi-challenge runs that add just a bit more difficulty to games I already enjoy. And that's why I chose this game as my first recorded Nuzlocke. It was fun, I enjoyed it, I hope you did too. If you enjoy Pokemon Challenge content, check out these other videos I've done and consider subscribing. And if you have suggestions for other challenges to try, leave a comment below. I'd love to hear what you have to say. Until then, thank you all so much for watching and I'll catch you in the next run. See ya.